Our next speaker is, uh, I hate to say it, but uh, he truly needs no introduction. Uh, he's Howard Nations, one of the uh, great trial lawyers, one of the great uh, ATLA members. Uh, I won't go through his CV in any kind of detail, uh, but you should know that um, along with the theme of the presentation today, Howard was one of the first attorneys to have computer-generated liability and medical animations admitted into evidence at trial. He's tried hundreds and hundreds of civil cases to verdict. He's, he's handled more than 300 pro bono criminal cases. Um, Howard co-founded the National College of Advocacy, which is AAJ's educational arm, and he's taught trial advocacy related courses in law school for 35 years. There is nobody better to talk about this subject and uh, please give a warm welcome to Howard Nations. Uh, this is an extremely important topic to us, and the reason it is is because, first of all, there's some, we have a lot of those folks to persuade, and they're different to persuade than the boomers that we've been used to, or even Generation X that we've been used to. Uh, first thing, basic communication methods. Verbal communication is 8% of the persuasive process. The words we use are important, but they're only 8% of carrying the message. The vocal communication, which is our, it's important because sincerity comes from the vocal. And it's 37% of the persuasive process. And the nonverbal communication is 55% of the persuasive process. I tell you this, this is all very fundamental, but I tell you this because this becomes extremely important when we're dealing with the latest generation, uh, the, the millennials. Uh, it's important that we maintain consistency and synthesis among our communicative techniques. The verbal, the nonverbal, and the vocal all have to deliver the same message. If you're saying one thing vocally and your nonverbal communication is, is sending a different message to the jury, the nonverbal communication will prevail every time. And if, it, if you're telling them one message and you're showing them something else, it's, it damages your trustworthiness, and trustworthiness is absolutely crucial, absolutely crucial to you as the messenger for your client's story. So data processing. We process data in three ways, and again, this has directly to do with the millennials and Gen X. It has to do with everybody, but it really has to do with dealing with the millennials. We, we process in our minds, in our brains, we process auditorily through sound. We process visually through sight. And then there's the kinesthetic process. And the kinesthetic process is the gut feel that we get, and it arises directly out of nonverbal communication. And since nonverbal communication is 55% of the persuasive process, there's a lot of this kinesthetic uh, going on. This is the situation you get in the, you get in the uh, jury room, and they heard, say, well, you know, I, I just heard Mr. Malone's final argument, and, you know, it was, it was great, but there's something about that case that just doesn't feel right to me. They can't explain it to you. It's, it's a, what we'd call a gut feeling. That's an important part of the persuasive process. And that's where the nonverbal communication comes in. They, they're having this kinesthetic adverse reaction to you and to your message because of something you did nonverbally. So we have to be aware of that uh, synthesis between the three. Now I'm going to go through this very fast. Liking lawyers, this is extremely important. You're the messenger. And the three things that make people like lawyers, are the jurors like lawyers, and this is the result of testing with 1,500 actual jurors in, in cases. First of all is dynamism, keeping them awake, because we, we essentially bore them to tears. We bore them to tears. The one word most frequently used by jurors in describing jury service, boring. Okay? And they watch TV. And they see all these funny things happen in court and all these dramatic things happen in court. And they, they are going to be on jury service and they go in and they can barely stay awake. Efficiency, not wasting their time. People don't like to, a lot of people on jury service these days don't like to be there. And they certainly don't want you wasting their time. So put on your, show your professionalism 
by making an efficient presentation of your evidence and do it with confidence. Trustworthiness, again, is the most important thing in the overall picture. If you lose your trustworthiness, then you're damaging your client's case. All right, generational distinctions. These are the generations uh, from, the, from uh, 1901 on. The GI generation, uh, Ronald Reagan. Uh, the silent generation, MLK and O'Connor, although I don't know you could call MLK silent, but the boomers are just uh, exemplified by the Clintons. Gen X, 68 to, to 81, the, the birth years, Kobe Bryant, uh, Generation Y, uh, Mila Kunis. All right, let's look at this, see who we're dealing with, get a better feel for who we're dealing with. Uh, Gen X, Michael Jackson, Kobe Bryant, Leonardo DiCaprio, Serena Williams. There are 40 million Gen Xers, 40 million. Um, then in 80, starting in 82, from 82 to 02, the millennials. Uh, Mila Kunis, the Olsen twins, and so forth. The important thing about that is that there are 75 million of these folks. And the, the next generation is probably going to be called the W's there for WWW, uh, the World Wide Web uh, generation. They're, they haven't really labeled them uh, that thoroughly yet, but that's the one that that, uh, that comes up most often. I've seen Generation Z. But the, one we're, the ones we're concerned about are the jury pool. Our jury pool consists of 80 million boomers. However, most of those people have figured out by now how to get out of jury service. So Generation X, 40 million boomers. Uh, 40 million Gen Xers. The millennials, 75 million. Um, the, the next thing, let's talk about the, and I don't want to bore you to death with this, but I got to have to explain this to you. Core, stripped over, core values and cohorts. Core values. People have, they have feelings, they have impressions, but the core, by, core values and beliefs are what stay with them. And the importance of these generational cohorts, these are things that happen to these people that are in the same age group, the same generation, that at various times in their lives that bind them together. So these generational cohorts, when you're talking about the things that happened to that whole generation, so they all had the same exposure to the same thing. And these have, they, they may have an, a lifetime impact. And the ones that we're looking at are the sociological events, and they tie people together. And notice the word lifelong. They create lifelong attitudes about jobs, money, and, and savings. The other are the sociological events that occur in, in what's called sexual adulthood that influences core values about permissiveness, permissiveness, tolerance, and so forth. But what we're concerned about is the, the core values that remain unchanged throughout their life. Now, so if they have these attitudes throughout their life, they're not going to change them, then the way we have to deal with it is it's called the uh, the, they call it in, in the movies, they call it the suspension of disbelief. Um, how many of you saw the movie Jurassic Park? How many of you really enjoyed Jurassic Park? How many of you believe that there are dinosaurs living on an island off the coast of Costa Rica? Eighteen of you, damn, that's a lot. Uh, okay. Now, why were you able to enjoy the movie Jurassic Park, even though you know very well, intellectually, that there are no dinosaurs living on an island off the coast of Costa Rica. It's the answer to it is the suspension of disbelief. Uh, Spielberg did such a great job with that that he, he got you to suspend your disbelief, the fact that you don't believe in dinosaurs. He got you to suspend that for two and a half hours. All right, we have to do the same thing. When you're dealing with people who have core beliefs and core values that are, that are opposed to what you are trying to prove to them, you're not going to change their core values. 
Let me say that again. You are not going to change their core values. That's why you're wasting time when you try to stand up there and explain away the McDonald case. When you go into great detail explaining all the reasons why the McDonald case was wrong. Because they believe it. And if you start trying to convince them that they're wrong about it, then you're placing yourself exactly on the opposite side of them as an opponent instead of being on the same side. So you have to move forward with them and, and you have to get them to suspend their core values if they're opposed to you for just your, the period of time of your trial. So now, and it, it can be done. Look at the situation today, for example, where Everyone hates Congress, 9% approval rating. Yet all Cong but 95% of congressmen are going to get reelected with no problem at all. Why? Everybody hates Congress, but they love their congressmen. Okay? Everybody can hate trial lawyers, but they can like the trial lawyer standing in front of them. So you have to be the trial lawyer that they like. That's why liking is so important. So you have to go in and put on a very cohesive, persuasive, honest, totally trustworthy case. You have to show that you care about your client. They can see that. If you don't believe your client's case, and you don't really care about your client, then get the hell out of the way and let somebody try the case who does. Because jurors can see that. Do not ever underestimate the collective wisdom of a jury. Um, it has always amazed me. Never, never underestimate the collective intelligence of a jury or the collective stupidity of voters. And they're the same people. Go figure. Uh, social, all right, so sociological generational studies. This, the data I'm talking to you about today is not the anecdotal generational stuff that was passed down from the trial lawyers in front of us to us. This stuff is based upon demographic research and forensic psychological applications. So let's talk about Gen X. Gen X, born between 61 and 81, their ages now are 33 to 53, uh, and they call Gen X because they don't have any of those, they didn't have any of those generational cohorts that bound them all together. There were no big events during that period of time like 911 or like Pearl Harbor, anything like that that bound them all together. So they, they came up with no strong self-identification. Let me tell you about Gen X. They became the target. They were the perfect target of tort reform. They are your major tort reformers. And we'll see that as we go through. Their social phenomenon is these people started out with a disrespect for law because they had the highest divorce rates, they had dwindling education, they had the highest crime rates in American history. And so they started out with disrespecting the divorce laws and therefore disrespecting the laws. They, uh, they really, in terms of their stability, they really want stability. They seek stability. They think stability is important. The, the, they stayed, this is the first generation that actually stayed home longer. They stayed home longer than any previous generations. And they're closer to their parents and they postponed independent living. This was the group that went back home after college. The average Gen Xer was staying home until they were uh, 28 years old. As opposed to previous generations, uh, the boomers were leaving home, they were going off to college or going off to the military and they'd never come back. Uh, but in this case, <coughs> Gen X uh, came back home. 51% of the uh, admire their parents the most of anybody. I guess it's because they let them live at home until they were 28. But they take responsible for their aging parents because they're still living in the house with them. Um, all right, now here's a big deal on, on Gen X, self-reliance. Both parents were outside the home in many cases but working. They grew up extremely independent and the Reagan social cuts cut them first. They were the ones when Reagan came in and took the knife and cut everything. They cut off all those social cuts for this generation. So these people came up with the idea, or they, they, were grow, they grew up with the idea of self-reliance. If I don't take care of myself, nobody's going to take care of me. What does that lead to? The number one the number one theme in the courthouse today is personal responsibility. Because these people, this generation, 
they came up with the whole idea that if I don't take care of myself, nobody's going to take care of me. So they also think as a juror, if you don't take care, if you, you don't, you're not doing anything for yourself, so why, why should I do anything for you? So here's, it wasn't that, it wasn't that they devised tort reform and tort reform happened to hit this group. What happened was you had these people you had this generation out there. And when Karl Rove and the other people involved in the forces of evil went out and started doing focus groups, they were focusing these people. So when they devised tort reform, tort reform was devised with messages that would fit Gen X. So that's why you, you, you'll see it, it develops very clearly here that self-reliance is, is the biggest theme. Uh, they had no reliance on the government because the government, they cut their social. Uh, they had to take care, <coughs> it's really water, oh here we go. They had to take care of their own health care and they had no deference to authority. They didn't care anything about the government because the government was doing absolutely nothing, uh, nothing for them. So think how different this is now. And this is the theme now, you, you hear any of this? Uh, do you see this uh, these days in politics? Um, employment, no security, no confidence, uh, and security to these folks mean having, meant having their own business. This was the first generation in American history. I mean, these, these folks got pounded. Gen X got pounded. It's the first generation in American history that actually had declining wages. They made less money than their parents, which is why they were back home living with their parents even after college. So these people, their their uh, politics, uh, post Nixon, they they were the weakest attachment to politics. Why? Because they didn't think politicians would do anything for them. The government could would couldn't be relied on for anything. They had the lowest voter participation for the same reason. No belief in politicians, especially after all the debacle with Nixon. They were even they really generated. I mean, they they really resented being tagged on the cover of Time magazine as Generation X. Um, so. The, the characteristics, they socially, they were more diverse, they were more tolerant, uh, and they were very much more acceptance uh, of people who were not like themselves. Uh, Gen X women, uh, greatest importance, the importance of the home and family. Really heavily, if you've got Gen Xers, if you've got damage to a family, if you've got injury to a family, you've got loss of a father, loss of a mother, loss of a husband, wife or child, these people, th that resonates, that resonates with these folks uh, because they are very, very family oriented. Um, now, their conservative mentality, uh, which is classic with tort reformers, uh, they were much more conservative than their previous uh, generation and they absolutely rejected blind liberalism of the of the 60s and the, the boomers in front of them. They rejected the anti-corporate mentality. Uh, we used to stand up with boomers, we're trying cases to boomers, we'd stand up and begin the, begin the opening with this is just another typical case of a corporation playing, placing uh, financial income ahead of the safety of their uh, employees or, or customers, whatever it was. You couldn't do that today. You couldn't, you, that would not be a good opening today because these people are skeptical towards the anti-corporate mentality. Uh, they, so they, they became perfect targets for tort reform. Now I want you to notice the reason we're separating these out is because the millennials are different. The millennials are different, and you think back to this when, when we get to, to the millennials. So these were the perfect targets for tort reform, uh, and in, uh, they were raised as tort reformers. Uh, they, personal responsibility was the biggest theme. It was, it was out there constantly. Uh, they believed the rhetoric because uh, Rove and the guys figured out how to talk to them. They focused them, and they gathered information from them and then they messaged that information and they turned around and fed that information back to them. 
and they fed it to them over and over and over. So the whole thing about frivolous lawsuits, frivolous malpractice cases, that became, that was the language of Generation X. Generation X thinks greedy trial lawyers is one word. It's, um, so the conservative skepticism, they rejected the boomer rhetoric regarding, listen to this, cheering for the underdogs, which the boomers did. Uh, the Clintons, uh, Clinton got a lot of mileage identifying with the underdogs, identifying with the downtrodden. Okay, that's rejected by Generation X. Uh, the uh, evil corporate America was rejected. They don't believe corporate America is evil. Um, for one reason is because in their generation, more and more money started to be paying into 401ks and more and more of their salaries started to be invested, invested in corporations. Their savings became invested in corporations. So they gained a financial interest as, as the stock market e expanded far beyond just the rich are just people who invested for a living, and uh, Mr. and Mrs. Middle America became uh, inextricably inter interwoven with the stock market, then all of a sudden corporate America became good because these are the guys who are creating my, my future. So that's why it became tougher to sue corporations. Um, equality for all, just way too, that's just, that's just boomer rhetoric. That's way too idealistic. So these folks are the perfect tort reformers and you gotta hand it to them. They've done it, they've done a very effective job. The AIDS crisis created conservative and, and cautious mentality um, and they're, they're just, they're, they're cautious throughout. Not, uh, they were also though, they, they learn best through imagery, but they don't respond. They're just conservative. So they just don't learn through, they don't, they reject flashy advertising and things of that nature. Now, they're cynical. They're very cynical. This, they believe more in UFOs than in receipt of their social security. Uh, does that sound like anything you hear if you ever watch Fox News? Um, 25, I was amazed by this statistic. 25, only 25% 25 regard themselves as religious. That is a very, very low number. But these, these folks just felt rejected by everybody. Uh, so here's how we, how's, here's how you, you communicate, things to take in mind when you're uh, communicating with them. Uh, they have high regard for long established traditions. So what you want to do with these folks is you want to talk about rules. You want to talk about traditions. So if you're trying the malpractice case, you want to wrap yourself, wrap your client in the Hippocratic Oath that, and the violation of the Hippocratic Oath by the defendant. First, do no harm. Uh, and they, are, they will respond to any type of rules that, that, that are rules that are grounded in long held traditions. Uh, secondly, they, they're persuaded by themes dealing with such as rules of the road, regulations. Now this is even more so. This is where they're very much like the millennials because they, these folks are raised with rules. Uh, everything they do is, is done with rules. <clears throat> so when you're talking about a med mal case, you talk about protocols. You talk about the violation of protocols, the violation of standards, the violations of rules. Um, when you're talking about uh, driving, you're talking about the rules of the road, but don't just talk about it. Put it, put it up on the screen, let them see it. Let them look at the rule. Let you, when, when your expert talks about what the rule is, show them what the rule is, show and tell on the rule. And then talk about the rule, the purpose of the rule, how they violated the rule, and the result of them violating the rule. Uh, rules uh, resonate with these people. Um, they relate to themes that appeal to their pra pragmatism. And this is their, their kind of their mantra. Eh, hope for the best, plan for the worst. Um, they resonate to themes that deal with their big, their big theme is self-reliance. They were raised with self-reliance. So if you represent a um, plaintiff who is severely injured and as a result of his, his or her injury, they are no longer self-reliant. They have to rely on somebody else to help them to get around, to help them to move, to help them. And of course, the worse the injury, the more these people would respond to it. 
if you talk about not the fact that they are uh, completely dependent on, on someone else, but you compare it to how self-reliant your plaintiff was before versus how their self-reliance has totally been lost because self-reliance is critical to Gen X. So it's damage to, damage to self-reliance will resonate with these folks. Uh, they, mistreat, they mistrust boomers, but they, they have a close relationship with their own parents and they place family and quality of life above a career. Uh, more than any other generation, they reject whiners. Uh, never talk about, never refer to your client as a victim and never put your client on the stand and have them whine about how much it hurts or where it hurts. The, what you should be really, this is for everybody, not just your exes, but you should be proving up that your client is doing the very best they can with what they have left. My theme is always courage in a personal injury case. They're, I try to demonstrate the courage that my client has. They have this, this, is, this was their life before, this was their life as a result of the, these horrible injuries, but they're facing it with courage. They're not seeking sympathy, they're not whining, they're facing it with courage, and this is the third life they're gonna have is what's gonna be the rest of their life. Uh, so talk about courage uh, as a theme as opposed to trying to get sympathy. Um, the extras are cautious and practical and they do not respect, they don't respond to hyperbole, drama, or overstatement. And they will listen for that. Remember, these are the tort reformers. These are the people that are taught that you're going to stand up there and you're going to lie to them right off the bat. That you're greedy trial lawyers and from the minute you stand up in front of one on board our examination or opening statement, they're going to be expecting hyperbole from you. And if you, uh, if you deliver hyperbole, then you're going to be playing right into the, directly into the theme that they've been taught. Yep, greedy trial lawyers. Um, the, it's important to, so with that in mind, instead of just hyperbole, you have to support your claim substantively. It's a conscious mind evidence, which is hard, hard evidence. And when it comes to this, you have to sequence properly. Sequence your evidence. Put your hard evidence in first. The hard evidence are, are numbers, uh, things they can see, x-rays, uh, real medical evidence that you have, uh, the documents, things that they can see and feel and touch, not the uh, physical pain, mental anguish, that sort of thing. You've got to establish your liability in the, in the mind of these people first. You've got to establish it substantively, and then you have to support it. But you have to support it substantively early in the game. Because remember, you're, you're not starting uh, on a level playing field with Generation X. You're starting with people that, that think you're going to be giving them hyperbole. So that's why it's so important to support it with substantive evidence.